From our point of view, the Tennis Centre really started in 1982 when we did a feasibility study which was done uh, of our initiative uh, because we saw a need. And I think that's important because in that study, we did put forward the concept of the moving roof, the gallery, and more or less defined the facilities that were ultimately built. The 1982 study sat around for several years and was looked at, but nothing happened until John McEnroe came out here and said that Kuyong was a dreadful venue, I think he called it a cow paddock. And as a result of that, I think there was a certain degree of panic where uh, the then LTAA thought that they might lose the Australian Open and were particularly concerned that it might go to Sydney. So uh, as a result of that concern, partly because we had done the study, we were employed to do a feasibility study to analyse uh, the potential to build a new centre in Melbourne. And we actually looked at 13 sites and developed seven in detail. And ultimately, as a result of uh, that piece of work, which had taken the facilities from the 1982 study and then applied them to the 13 and then seven sites, a decision was taken to do a more detailed feasibility study of the site that we referred to as Old Scotch and Old Zavarian's Oval. And that was seen to be the best prospect. As a result of that study, um, the government then decided that they would uh, go ahead with the facility and they allocated something of the order of 60 million funds that could have been brought into the job. The government uh, then decided that uh, they'd like more architectural representation. They didn't want it only controlled by the LTA, which was a private organisation. And they went through the exercise of uh, wanting a second architect to be brought into the job, uh, which we already had a contract to do the project. Uh, so they proposed three architects and we chose uh, Philip Cox to work with us jointly uh, but we had 75% of the commission and Philip Cox's office had 25%. Uh, a joint study was then put together by uh, the joint firms uh, which is probably more generated by Philip Cox's office than ours in that we thought the whole centre was uh, uh, going to be too complex in the way that that particular study uh, unfolded and um, it was then costed out at 120 million and the government shut down the job and as a result of uh, that exercise um, we thought well a job was disappearing we thought it was the end of our uh, grand project we got together with Len Lease, which was partly our initiative, but Len Lease were also interested in pursuing the job. They said there's a great project to be done. Uh, we then, of our own accord, put together a detailed study for the project, which came up with the concept from our original 1982 piece of work of a moving roof. Uh, which would be jointly an entertainment centre as well as a tennis centre, which was not really the subject of the original work that was done jointly over the two architects. So that piece of work done by us jointly with uh, Lend Lease, uh, or then, then it was called Civil and Civic, not Lend Lease, uh, was probably the centrepiece of making the project work. And when we went through that exercise, uh, Lend Lease came up with a number of incredibly innovative concepts, a guaranteed maximum price. And this was the first government job that had a guaranteed maximum price. And uh, they guaranteed the price, but they didn't actually guarantee what product fitted within that price. So it was a huge gamble from everyone's point of view. And then the government sort of resurrected the job and when they resurrected the job it was done uh, on the basis that the original architectural team would come back into it. So our drawings from the Lend Lease exercise were sent to Philip Cox who then came back and made a really good contribution styling the project but the content was defined by us including the moving roof and the planning of the facility. So um, ultimately Lend Lease then went through and engineered the project to deliver it for the original guaranteed maximum price which was approximately 60 million which was the original budget 
And we all went on the journey of inventing so many things. It was the moving roof, uh, which incidentally only cost 2.7 million out of the 60 million. And most people would think that that was an extraordinarily expensive thing. It wasn't. It was just very simple engineering. And the only moving roof that had um, predated it at that time was a $600 million roof on the Sky Dome in Toronto. So um, the original Tennis Centre was uh, an exercise in creative thinking across so many different things. Uh, and when it was delivered, it was delivered for the original price. Uh, it achieved uh, everything that anybody could have expected at that time. And it was a result of many people making contributions to it. Uh, and those layers of contribution really uh, created a centrepiece of Melbourne's culture, we believe. Now, when it opened up, it, it opened up to uh, a most fantastic event. Uh, uh, we, in the opening ceremony, I, I was sitting there, the moving roof opened for the first time, and uh, there was a most spectacular sunset. Molly Meldrum was sitting close by and said, oh, you even got God doing the lighting effects. And, uh, you know, all these sort of uh, events that have unfolded there with all the entertainment events over the year, that's probably, uh, over the years, it's probably far more significant than the, just the tennis. It's really part of Melbourne's culture year round. Now that's the first part of the tennis centre. Uh, we then, um, I suppose Petal Thorpe were then appointed to be architects working on the project for 20 years, so by ourselves, so it was our project for 20 years. And during that period of time, um, the original layout had railway maintenance sheds to the north, and I think people have probably forgotten about that. Uh, but the stage two was then the extension of the tennis centre into the railway maintenance shed zone to create the garden square, the outside courts, and the function centre. That was a project that was completed for 20 million. Then there was another stage where we added High Sense Arena. And High Sense Arena is the only multi purpose uh, building that combines velodrome, basketball, tennis, and entertainment in one venue. It is indeed the only multi-purpose velodrome in the world that achieves all of that. And it perhaps hasn't been appreciated that it's not the kind of iconic building that Rod Laver Arena it is, but it's the most multi-purpose building uh, in that category probably in the world. So that added another dimension to the facility and really turned um, uh, Melbourne Park into really part of Melbourne's culture. Our role down there probably ended about 10 years ago as bureaucracies and management changes and I suppose they've spent an extraordinary amount of money down there in the last period of time um, developing the project further which we haven't been part of. Uh, I think the uh, probably the era that we were responsible for spent about a total of 160 million um, building the core of the centre and developing it over 20 years. I think they've spent pretty close to a billion dollars in the last period of time. But I think the centrepiece of the Tennis Centre in Melbourne Park will always be what we achieved. <laughs>